Good evening and welcome. I'm Chris Bolzan, the Executive Director of the Gloucester Marine Genomics Institute, and I'm excited to welcome you to a new season of the JAMGI Science Hour. In January, we heard from Dr. Vincent Pirabon of the Pierce Laboratory, Yale University and Ocean X. Tonight, we bring you Dr. William Fennecal of the Scripps Institution of Oceanography in San Diego, who has mined the ocean to unlock solutions to many global health challenges. And we are honored to have him this evening sharing his story with the GMGI community. He is an inspiration to us as we endeavor to address critical challenges facing our oceans, human health, and the environment through innovative scientific research and education. By bringing world-class science and transformative workforce development to Gloucester's historic waterfront, GMGI is catalyzing the regional economy. A bit about GMGI before I turn things over to Dr. Andrea Bodner, our Donald G. Combs Science Director, who will introduce Dr. Fennecal and facilitate this evening's Q&A. Dr. Bodner's research team pursues a strategy based on a platform of advanced molecular biology and genomics technologies that impacts fisheries and human health and helps expand our understanding of the world's oceans. In this past year, they have, cra they have cracked the lobster genome, published groundbreaking research on the long-lived red sea urchin, and made progress towards advancing discoveries that will stimulate the local economy. Our education initiative prepares recent high school graduates to become trained lab technicians through our Gloucester Biotechnology Academy. We are currently expanding to create a new biomanufacturing learning environment, doubling our capacity of our program and enhancing our curriculum. The class of 2021 will complete their training in just a few short weeks and embark on their industry internships in Boston, Cambridge, and the North Shore. Through our science community efforts, we are actively promoting conditions that encourage the establishment of a vibrant science community in and around Gloucester. This includes the annual GMGI Science Forum and a second conference we will introduce this fall focused on innovations in science education and biomanufacturing workforce development. Tonight, I encourage you to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen for any questions you might have for Dr. Fennecal. Thank you all so much for tuning in and for continuing to share in our excitement for our oceans and science education. A special thank you goes out to the 1911 Trust Company, managing North Shore and Boston family wealth for six generations, and the James and Gail Bacon Family Trust. I'll turn the screen over now to Andrea, who will introduce Dr. Fennecal. Andrea? Thanks, Chris. Good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us this evening. I'm Andrea Bodner, the Donald G. Combs Science Director at GMGI, and it's my pleasure to be introducing tonight's Science Hour speaker, Dr. William Fennecal. Bill is a distinguished professor of oceanography and pharmaceutical science and the founding director of the Center for Marine Biotechnology and Biomedicine at Scripps Institution of Oceanography at the University of California, San Diego. Bill received a PhD in organic chemistry from the University of California, Riverside, and spent a few years teaching and as a research scientist in industry before joining Scripps in 1973. At Scripps, his work integrates oceanography, marine microbiology, and human health. He quickly established himself as a leading expert in marine natural products research and is, a recognized world, and is recognized worldwide as a pioneer in discovering drugs from the sea. Throughout his career, he has explored many of the world's oceans uh, to discover chemical entities from marine microorganisms, plants, and animals to treat human disease uh, with a focus on new antibiotics and anti-cancer agents. Bill has received numerous awards throughout his career, including the Paul uh, Skewer Award uh, in Marine Natural Products Chemistry, the Silver Medal Award in uh, Chemical Ecology, the American Chemical Society Ernest Genther Award, and the National Cancer Institute Merit Award. He's a fellow of the American Society of Pharmacognosy and also a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. It is a tremendous honor to have Bill with us this evening so that he can share some of the work that he has done throughout the world's oceans over an incredible scientific career. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to, to Bill, and welcome to the Science Hour. 
Well, thank you very much indeed uh, for that overly generous introduction, I would say. Um, I'm really happy to be here uh, and to uh, come at a very special day, I have to say. Um, let's see, I want to share screen. And okay. And what I'd like to do tonight is to talk a little bit about where medicines come from and the new environment of the ocean to create new medicines to treat diseases we have trouble curing. I show this slide in particular because I want to point out that it's been very important for me as a trained chemist to be involved with people that are truly involved in treating human disease. Our Moore, Moore's Cancer Center in particular has given me an opportunity to really see the devastations of cancer and to try and, and do more to try and understand just how much we're going to need these new medicines. So tonight on February 11th, 2021, I also wanna start by showing something uh, that I hope all of you are aware of. Today is the International Day of Women and Girls in Science. And I'm particularly excited to be able to talk to you tonight because I have a relative, my granddaughter, is a, a budding scientist, she's doing extremely well. And so this is something that I feel very strongly about, is getting women and girls into science early on in high school and middle school, and then getting them into professional careers in science. So let's go back and let's talk about the origin of the antibiotics. In 1929, Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin, the man on the right, quite by accident, I would say. Uh, but this began several decades of early examination of soil and the isolation of bacteria and fungi from common terrestrial soil. Selman Voxman on the left, uh, was the discoverer of actinomycin, for example. And both of these gentlemen laid the foundation for the early evolution of the pharmaceutical industry. For more than 50 years, pharmaceutical industry mined new molecules by culturing terrestrial microbes and more than 120 antibiotics, cancer drugs, and other bioactive compounds were discovered for treating human diseases. This was truly the foundation and this focus on soil and on microorganisms in soil went on till at least the mid 1990s. And many, many drugs were discovered as I said. However, in about 1995, uh, they decided, the pharmaceutical industry decided that they needed to do something new. They were getting diminishing returns. And so they went on to look at other sources like synthetic chemistry and other areas. Now, one of the reasons you could ask, why didn't the pharmaceutical industry start to work in the ocean? I mean, the ocean is 70% of the earth. Why didn't they go to the ocean and explore it. And of course, they didn't have the, the, the background, the technology, microbiologists were basically terrestrial microbiologists, but there were a number of things that happened. Early on, people said, you know, there aren't any chemically rich bacteria in the ocean. And this became more or less one of the reasons why uh, pharmaceutical industries and even scientists really didn't look at marine microbiology until uh, around the late 1990s. 
One thing happened though that caught my attention and was completely overlooked in the early work that was done on antibiotics. And this was discovery of, a, of an antibiotic by Paul Burkholder, shown in the photo on the left. Paul was really a revolutionary and innovative man. And he went to the ocean, he went to the Caribbean and he isolated uh, a bacterium called Pseudomonas bromoutilis. And this microbe made this revolutionary mic compound with five bromine atoms attached to it. Very potent against Staph aureus, and it was recognized at that point in time. But this was really the only ex example of early work. But it was enough to keep us interested, and we decided to continue on. Now, what's going on in the ocean? This is an enormous microbial resource. 70% is ocean, uh, and ocean water itself has about a, a million cells per milliliter. But even more robust are deep ocean sediments that have about 1 billion bacterial cells per cubic centimeter. Massive diversity is out there, and we're now just beginning to learn something about what they are, how to culture them, and what they might produce in treating human disease. So throughout my career, two people that I show here have had the biggest impact and made the most significant contributions. Paul Jensen, professor in my institution, uh, was the first to really innovate in marine microbiology, isolating organisms using different tools. And then somewhere along the way, Tracy Mincer, then a graduate student, brought to our attention the beginning use of genomic information, of phylogenetics, and using gene sequences to identify at high uh, identity, identify bacteria. So these two people have had a major impact on this field. Now, when I first went to Scripps Oceanography, I was a trained organic chemist. I worked in synthetic chemistry. And the first thing that happened to me way back in 1975 was I was told that I should learn how to use a research vessel. And of course, I had no idea. Uh, we began by using some small, different kinds of small ships. Uh, and later on, started using some larger ships. This one, the Seward Johnson, uh, is a ship that we would rent every summer from the Harbor Branch Oceanographic and take a group of scientists out into the ocean to learn more about the chemistry of marine life, isolate microorganisms, and work in collaborations. The area we did most of the work was in the Bahamas, which is a beautiful, uh, pristine area that is uh, easy to work in, many protected areas, and uh, superb study sites are available. Uh, and we worked, a lot of our work was at Sweeting's Key, as pointed out on this map. Uh, I'll also tell you, there were a few interesting things that happened over the years. The Bahamas is uh, kind of an open place. Uh, there aren't many police around. And on one particular trip, uh, we were actually attacked by pirates with shotguns. And fortunately, we were able to outrun them. And the captain of the small vessel I was on uh, was able to uh, discourage them from any further uh, impact. But by and large, over 20 years, we had nothing but very positive experiences in the Bahamas, very friendly people, and a lot of the work that we've done began in the Bahamas. Now, this is what a crew looks like on one of the bigger ships. Um, and the goal we had was to bring biologists, microbiologists, chemists, pharmacologists, uh, ecologists, the whole group of people 
to look at uh, an area that we would study from a chemistry, microbiology, macrobiology, and ecology point of view. And so you're looking at people in different age groups here that all of which now basically are professionals, they're professors in various universities, and they've had illustrious careers, basically carrying on in marine disciplines, different disciplines. You know, what attracted a lot of people early on to doing marine research, and I understand that, uh, was the fact that they could get into scuba diving in very beautiful waters, warm, clear waters. And I think this was a, a, an appeal of some value and, and certainly brought many people into marine science. And of course, scuba wasn't invented until after the World War II. And so scientists were pretty slow to pick up on using scuba uh, in order to do their work. Uh, you know, we could dive and we could collect some samples and we decided that, you know, we can't dive much deeper than about 30, 35 meters typically, but we wanted to collect samples deeper. And so what we did was to devise a simplified mud snapper device that was connected with just with, with rope to a cable and we could then drop a collection device that you see here uh, to the bottom of the ocean. When it hits the bottom, it took a sample and we would then bring it up. And on the right side, you see when you open the jaws that there is a sample of bottom mud in that container. Now we could do this maybe up to a hundred meters, but that was even stretching it and of course, uh, that's not what the ocean is composed of. The ocean is much more vast than that. But this was nonetheless the first time that we would be able to get some samples deeper than scuba depth. In the Bahamas, we began also looking at shallow waters in some of these mangrove channels, no more than three, four meters deep. Uh, and we began to see the isolation of these bacteria called the actinomycetes. And these are the kinds of bacteria that are very chemically rich. A vast majority of the antibiotics and cancer drugs come from this class of microbe. These are gram positive uh, uh, bacteria. And sample we collected at Acklands Island gave us this streptomycete on the right side, Streptomyces is the genus. Uh, and what we soon learned was that this particular isolate requires salt for growth. Uh, now, this was inconsistent with the arguments that there's nothing new in the ocean, it's just all terrestrial. It had also, we learned by that time, to use the 16S ribosomal gene sequence, and it was unique. And this was probably, when we think back, the first truly unique marine bacterium that we had isolated. Not only was it interesting from a microbiology point of view, but when we did the chemistry, we found that it was producing antibiotics of completely different types, and even then, more importantly, the fact that there was the element bromine was being incorporated into these organic molecules. Now, you'll remember the first example uh, that I showed of, a, of an antibiotic uh, in 1966. The first example and only example was also a highly brominated uh, molecule. And so bromination is an interesting trait in the ocean. It is not only produced by bacteria, but plants and animals also brominate. And of course, this is because the element bromine as bromide and chloride are present in ocean water in very large uh, numbers. But this gave us the first concept 
that we were on the right track to get to really begin to invest in marine microbiology. Now, what you're looking at here is the bottom of the ocean at 4,000 meters depth. This is a time-lapse video, so you can see that things are moving around. And what impressed me, and I think impresses oceanographers, is that the bottom of the ocean is not a desert. It is not a wasteland. In fact, it's a highly rich environment, a competitive environment, and the bottom muds themselves are rich in diverse bacteria. 4,000 meters. And so we said, you know, how can we possibly sample at 4,000 meters? There were a few samples available from the deep sea drilling project, which didn't work out very well because they were contaminated with oil. Uh, we had to think about how we were going to sample much more deeply in the ocean than we had been with that simple device. And so we started designing. In the center top is the original little device that we used. It was kind of a homemade snapper device. But then we began to make different types of coring devices that you can see on the left-hand side and in the bottom middle. These coring devices, we drop from boats. They drop to the bottom of the ocean. They're attached by these uh, uh, electric reels attached with a high tensile strength Dacron line. And when they reach the bottom, the sample in the bottom goes up into the middle of the coring device. We then bring it back up to the surface. And we now have not only bottom sediment, but stratified bottom sediment, where we're starting at the very top of the sediment and going down to areas where it's, there's less oxygen. And so these gave us some opportunities uh, to really see what's going on in, a in some deeper samples. And we were routinely collecting samples to around 2,000 meters easily. So over the years, we and Paul Jensen and myself and others like Alejandra Prieto Davo invested heavily in marine microbiology. We began using unique nutrients that were found in bottom muds uh, that were not common in terrestrial environments, no glucose, for example, in beginning. Uh, and we began to collect and process thousands of samples. What you see on the right is just how diverse these look. These microbes played it out on agar uh, petri dishes. Of course, we use the 16S ribosomal RNA gene sequencing, uh, and we tested to see if organisms were capable of growing in seawater and if they would not grow in freshwater media. We struggled with the idea of what, what defines a marine bacterium. Is it the, the fact that they require seawater? Is it the chemistry that they produce? What are the elements that are important to define a marine microbe? Over quite a large number of years, Paul Jensen and others were able to isolate and collect at least 14 what I will call MAR groups that were not within the normal systematics uh, of the uh, six families of these actinomycetes bacteria, they were something new. And so we began to wonder what they were. <clears throat> we began thinking about how we would identify them. And we became focused on this MAR1, which is the uh, Salinospora, here, this is one of the most important discoveries that we, Paul Jensen and I and others made because they are completely marine. They do not grow in fresh water. 
they are really marine actinomycetes. This is what the first three species looked like. Almost all of them are orange or red pigmented strains. Um, and we literally isolated thousands of strains. They also don't occur everywhere. Salinospora tropica, for example, only occurs in the tropical Atlantic Ocean for some reason, we don't know why. Uh, so all of these require seawater. And I would point out that now because of of Paul's extensive investigation of this genus, there are now seven full species that are recognized of the Salinospora. And again, point out that Tracy was able to really teach us because of his background, how to use these new tools to identify these things at very fine resolution. How do we grow them? Now, we, we typically grow them in one liter replicates. We tried to use fermenters, it was just too much, but we now know that you can do one liter replicates in a big shaker table like this, uh, and we use adsorbent resin technology. When these bacteria grow, they secrete molecules into the culture media, and we can then isolate those uh, and find out what their activities are and what their structural chemistries are. So what have we found? I'll just mention three things that we found over the last, uh, I guess, 20 years. Uh, and the first thing we found was with Salinospora tropica, from the Bahamas, that when you culture this, it produces some extremely potent agents of potential use in treating cancer. Uh, we saw effects at around 10 nanograms per mil against colon carcinoma and purified the active ingredient, which you can see here, which we called salinosporamide. It's a different chemical structure type. And we realized that this was something that had potential. In order to develop it, Paul and I co-founded a biotech company called Narius Pharmaceuticals. And Narius developed it uh, as the drug name Marizomib. Uh, and ultimately, it was passed on to Celgene and then on to Bristol-Myers Squibb. This compound is now in phase three human trials, the last trial uh, for glioblastoma, which is of course a very debilitating uh, cancer. And the reason it's in glioblastoma is that it was found that it would pass through the blood brain barrier and could be used to treat tumors in the brain. So we're very excited about this. It should be close to being potentially approved as a drug. In another study, we discovered a penicillium species, not really well known, uh, which we isolated from the surface of a green alga by the name of Halamida. We called the compound hal halamide, it's very potent, uh, but it was, it was derivatized into another compound that you see here, which is even more potent. And this compound is under the trade name plenibulin. This is also in phase three human clinical trials, but against non-small cell lung cancer. And it's even at, at our cancer center here in San Diego. And likewise, we, we have great hopes that this will, uh, you know, be something that will be developed into uh, medicinal for the treatment of cancer. Now, here's a, a last example of an antibiotic. Uh, Chris Kaufman, who you see on the left, happened to be on the beach in Santa Barbara. And he said, I think I'll take some beach sand 
bring it back. Uh, and he cultivated it. And he found out that there was a Streptomyces species, not a well-known one, something possibly new. Uh, and the culture extract showed extremely strong activity against bacillus and thracis, as well as methyl methicillin resistant staph aureus, both of which are devastating bacterial pathogens. Bacillus anthracis is the cause of anthrax poisoning. And at the time, we were hoping we could find something that might be useful in treating anthrax um, in, in infection. So what we did was to go through this, we isolated a compound, C25H3204. This is the NMR spectrum of it. And we began to do the chemical analysis. Uh, we arrived at the structure on the left. It is a new chemical type, a new structure type that had never been seen before. Uh, and we were excited about that and began working with uh, a professor Nize in our school of medicine, who is a medical microbiologist. And we began to look at the effects of anthracomycin on methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. At first, of course, we did it uh, against uh, any, any organisms in petri dishes, uh, which of course showed very potent activity. But then we went to a mouse model, which is injected with MRSA and has only a five day survival. So what you can see on the graph, if we treat uh, at 10 milligrams per kilogram, here there's 96% survival of the mice. If you do not treat uh, there's only about a 10% survival over time. So this is an active in vivo antibiotic that cures animals from septic death induced by methicillin resistant staph aureus. It is the first in class antibiotic uh, that illustrates the fact that the ocean uh, can yield a whole host of new antibiotics. Now, another thing that people told us was that you can't culture anything from the ocean. Now, why would they say that? Well, because some experiments were done in which microscopic analysis of seawater showed on the left that there were thousands of diverse looking microbes in water. Uh, but when you then put them onto culture plates, only tens of strains grew. And you know, the question then became, well, perhaps they can't be cultured. Maybe they're fundamentally unculturable in the ocean. And we didn't think that was reasonable, uh, but we didn't have any data to discount it either. Clearly some things, don't grow. They might be dead. We don't know. But the question that 95, 98% don't grow, well, they're growing in the ocean. So we decided to look at what these microbes were. And on the left, this is a tree of all of the microbiology, of all the prokaryotes showing all the different families. In red, these are the uncultured bacteria that are known. They're known because you can extract DNA from seawater. And when you sequence DNA from seawater, you see these, but you can't apparently grow them. So we decided we would take a look at that concept. And what we did was to design some new methods. And I'll call this culturing the uncultured. You know, what we learned right away was that the field of microbiology is dominated by history. That old microbiological methods, perhaps back to Pasteur and even earlier, 
we're still being used uh, as a way to isolate microorganisms. Uh, you know, but are those exactly what we need for the ocean? So we decided to abandon some of those, perhaps make up some of our own ideas. The first thing that came to mind was that the ocean is very, very low in, in nutrients. And so we made up different kinds of nutrients that reflect the ocean, in, including just culturing in regular seawater. And things grew and they grew pretty well. But one of the more important things that we discovered was that you couldn't expect bacteria to grow on agar, forming colonies on agar, like I showed you. You couldn't expect that to happen in a short period of time. You know, terrestrial bacteria, typically human pathogens, E. coli, that sort of thing. You can see them in two days, three days. What we did was to do culturing experiments for six months. And over months of waiting, we started to see these microbes on the left. We started to see a whole host of these and realized that these were completely new bacteria that no one had ever seen before, except perhaps by extracting DNA from seawater. These are the organisms. We just gave them some trivial numbers. Um, and some of them we'd seen before by this extraction of DNA uh, procedure. But virtually all of these are new species, new genera, and maybe even families and even bacterial orders. Uh, it's, it was very exciting to see these. And of course, we did the 16S rhylo, uh, phylogenetic analysis of this and realized that we were looking. Now, why is that important? Well, you know, here's two strains. Uh, and, uh, you know, we would have never seen these to look for any kind of antibiotics or any other kinds of bioactive compounds unless we had taken this approach. So we cultured two strains that we were also uh, able to, to uh, name, Morea alkaloidigena and Catalina monas alkaloidigena, two strains. And those two strains produced these new alkaloidal antibiotics. Very exciting to see that. And it points out that you have to look a little more carefully to see what kinds of organisms are present out there and devise new tools, new methods to figure out what's going on. Now, last, I wanna make a few comments about I call it where chemistry and biology intersect, but it is really in the genome of bacteria. Uh, and explore, everybody's exploring the microbial genome. And the reason is that bacterial genomes are easily described, easily analyzed, pretty easily. And the genomes are small. And what you can see in those genomes are biosynthetic gene clusters that make things. And they're typically easily condensed into certain regions of the genome. And so there are tools now, uh, computer methods to analyze genomes uh, up to you know, eight megabytes and larger, three, four. Uh, 30, 40 megabytes, and look at what kinds of things are being made, potentially being made, that bacteria have the genetic capacity to make. Now, by comparison, marine plants and animal genomes are, are enormously difficult. They're quite large and a lot of times these gene clusters are not in the same place on the genome. And so working with these genomes is much more difficult. But much to many people's 
uh, credit, they're starting to figure out how to do that. And of course, once that happens, it's opening up a whole host of new opportunities. So I wanna show you an example of where we used some genome information. And that's with this micromonospora strain that was also collected um, in the Bahamas. And uh, we isolated it in dilute seawater media, no additional nutrients. It grew well, as you can see, kind of an orange, uh, pretty strain on agar, uh, isolated and identified as micromenospora. The extract early on was tested against HCT, which is colon carcinoma, and it showed that it killed those cells at a pretty good potency, but not, not the best. Ultimately, we isolated a potent anti-cancer compound, the formula of which was C50H82O12. Massively complicated structure. Uh, you know, 20 years ago, you could never, ever have identified something of that size. So we went through and got the, the analysis of this, looked at the 16S. We also uh, sequenced the genome using a combination of Illumina and PacBio sequencing, which worked very well. We found the genome size, we found a plasmid and a phage, and we also found a large cluster, large, very large cluster in that genome that we thought should be responsible for the production of this large molecule, C50H82. Uh, here's the genome. There are 15 other uh, biosynthetic gene clusters making a whole host of things, aminoglycosides, terpenoids, and so on. Um, and, but this one, this one, which is a type one polyketide cluster, uh, as you can see, is the largest cluster in the genome. And it makes this massively large compound. Now, when you look at that structure and you see 12 oxygens, what comes to mind right away is that there are lots of hydroxy groups. And if there's hydroxy groups, there's lots of asymmetry in the molecule. So what we basically did with the help of Henrik Machado and Paul Jensen, we basically went in and looked at that gene cluster and realized that there were 19 modules and they're loaded, listed here in which the, the structure of this molecule was built up by the addition of two or three carbon atoms in each module. Furthermore, in these modules, there are a series of biosynthetic enzymes, ketosynthase, acyl transferase, et cetera, ketoreductase, uh, for example, and these are enzymes and they typically function in a stereochemically pure manner. So if you look a little bit closely down at some of these hydroxyl groups, you'll see that we have them coming up out of the plane or down out of the plane. And we began to use those known uh, enzyme specificities to assign the structure of uh, this compound. Now I'm gonna skip over a lot of work uh, by Henrik Machado and, and Min Kim uh, to identify this molecule. Here it is, C50, very complicated. 19 chiral asymmetric centers in the molecule. Um, and it was done almost only by genomic analysis of those enzymes. Of course, we had to prove it because this is something new. It's not absolutely clear you can do this every time. So Dr. Kim was able to do complete NMR work and in most cases, confirm the structure. 
Now, this is an amazingly important molecule. It's extraordinarily active against U87 glioblastoma. Uh, the, L, the lethal dose at 50% is 1.7 times 10 to the minus six micromolar, around picomolar activity. And it's 2,200 times more potent against glioblastoma than this colon carcinoma that we saw in the beginning. So this is a molecule that several people are synthesizing now. We're making it, it isn't particularly stable, which is the bad, bad news, but it is a wonderful molecule to look forward to. So in conclusions, microbes in the world's ocean represent a massive new resource for the discovery of new drug candidates leading to new medicines. They are diverse. We can learn, we have learned how to culture most of them maybe, uh, but you know, we need to use new methods in recognition that the oceans are a different environment. You know, while all this is happening, we need to use microbial genomic information to figure out what these organisms can produce and then to perhaps isolate them and define them. And lastly, I think the using these sequence data of these enzymes that allow you to look at how they're making molecules uh, needs to become more and more useful. And right now we're using it with caution, but later on, I think you'll see that we'll know a lot more and it will be routine. So what remains is for me to say something about the individuals. I've already mentioned Paul Jensen, my colleague. I wanna mention Chris Kaufman. Chris uh, was the foundation of our uh, microbial cultivation program. Uh, he could do everything. He could isolate bacteria from samples. He could culture in small scale, in large scale. He could do it all. And um, he's responsible for a lot of success that we made. Uh, Tracy Mincer, now a professor at Florida Atlantic University, uh, did amazing things when he was a student with us here at SIO. And uh, he's now doing amazing things at Florida Atlantic University. I mentioned Henrique Machado. I mentioned Min Kim. Henrique is a, is a biologist, a, a genomics microbiologist. Min Kim was trained in Korea as a natural products chemist. Uh, Reiko Cullum is a, a master's level um, chemist, organic chemist uh, from Tokyo, got her master's degree in Waseda. University, and she's just done a wonderful job keeping all the ends together everywhere uh, in this program. Financial support, uh, most of it came from NIH, uh, some from NSF. I should mention that uh, our use of research vessels came via grants from the Ocean Going National Laboratory, so-called UNOLS uh, program at NSF, and that was a wonderful opportunity that really provided the foundation of what we have done. So with that, uh, I wanna thank you all for listening and coming tonight. Uh, I am certainly happy to take questions. Uh, and I suppose that, uh, okay, Andrea will moderate some of these questions. Thank you so much, Bill. That was a wonderful talk. It was a, an amazing body of work that really clearly demonstrates the potential impact or the impact of the ocean directly on human health. So it, absolutely fantastic. You mentioned you, Paul, Paul Jensen uh, several times during your talk. And I, for those in the audience who don't know, I just want to mention that we're very fortunate to have Paul Jensen as a member of our scientific advisory board here at GMGI. So fantastic. We're fortunate to have him at our institution. <laughs> there are lots of questions from the audience, so hopefully we'll have time to get through a few of these. Okay. Um, so as, as a scientist in an oceanographic institute, 
what are the most critical collaborations that you have developed in order to move forward with potential candidates for drug development? Are they, is it MDs who are specialists in certain therapeutic areas, PhDs who study fundamental nature of disease or biotech pharma companies? All of the above. Uh, you know, uh, being a, in a program that is fundamentally grant supported, we look for opportunities. I didn't have a chance to talk much about COVID-19, but we're working on a drug for COVID-19 as well, that we just don't have refined data. But, you know, if you're going to work in a biomedical area, uh, and if you're going to try and apply a new resource, an ocean, you have to have people educate you about the ocean, about microbiology. You have to have scientists in our cancer center educate me about what is required in a cancer drug. Antibiotics, you know, something kills something in a dish. It doesn't matter. It has to work in an animal. So collaborations to get that kind of new data and to understand what medicines are required is critical. Thank you. Uh, and following on from that, how, how do you go about starting to figure out the mechanisms of actions uh, in the different cancers uh, treated by your new compounds? Yeah. Well, you know, also that's not something that I'm capable of doing. But we've had collaborations with big industries like Bristol Myers Squibb, with small industries like Marius Pharmaceuticals. And the tools are pretty common. Um, you know, you start looking at how a substance kills a cancer cell. And you start asking, when does it kill the cancer cell? In what stage of cell division is this cell killed? And when you learn that, then you start asking things about what's the target inside the cancer cell. And there are some very common targets that you can look at. Um, again, I don't do it, but you can kill some cells and then you can extract proteins from those cells and see what's happening, what kinds of proteins are being inhibited. You can also make mutant cell lines that don't have some of these targets and see if your compound doesn't work. So you can learn about that, but it takes a while. But the real importance in a cancer drug is showing that it's safe and that it cures a tumor in an animal. The mechanism is important, but you would never look at the mechanism or target until you could see that it works in an animal. Thank you. Um, there's a couple of questions along this line. Um, what, what do you know about why these organisms make these molecules? What are they doing for them in, the, in their natural environment? I can only speculate uh, because nobody really knows. But you know, if you look at uh, the bottom of the ocean, uh, it is not that rich an environment for nutrients. You can think of it in this way, at 4,000 meters deep, life down there has to wait for something to come down. Uh, a dead whale would be, wow, you know, end up in the sediments and provide nutrients for years, probably. But the microbes in the sediments are competing with a whole host of other microbes, also invertebrates, uh, that they have to outcompete to survive. So the concept is that these are functional molecules used for survival, maybe defensive agents, but there's also a whole host of, of investigators that believe the molecules are communication that they communicate with other organisms in the environment. Um, you know, I think it's more a bioactivity based thing because we see bioactivity of, of one type or another in virtually everything we isolate. 
wonderful. Um, are there areas in the ocean that are more lucrative to mine uh, for, for new compounds? Well, again, that, that's probably somewhat speculation. I can't tell you that um, we've had more fun in the tropical oceans, but I think for probably more than one reason. Uh, and, but what I can tell you about that is that the microbial populations in the bottom are not uniform. They are very patchy. So you might take a sample in one place and go, you know, one meter away and take another sample and it will not be the same. It will not be as robust. So it probably has to do with nutrients, both organic and inorganic in these sediments. Uh, it may have to do with oxygen concentrations and other kinds of features, you know, anaerobic sediments, sediments without oxygen um, have a completely different biota. So, you know, I think it's patchy for mainly, I think, for nutrient availability reasons. Right. Actually, there's a couple of questions about how you grow these. And, and someone is wondering, what, um, have you tried growing microbes under high pressure? Um, and uh, also, someone wanted to know about if you're growing things in anaerobic conditions as well. So do you, do, do you change the conditions for your culturing to try and encourage different things? Yeah. To grow? Well, well, first of all, um, you need to be a specialist to grow things under high pressure. And lots of microbiologists have done that. Um, you know, people have devised high pressure culture vessels that they can grow bacteria at 500 times atmospheric pressure. And this is about the pressure down at the hydrothermal vents. So people have been fascinated with the so-called barophilic bacteria that live in the deep ocean. And, and, you know, a good number are barophiles and we can't grow them. We certainly couldn't grow them, you know, to produce a kilogram of a new drug. So we haven't focused on that at all. We've done a little bit of variation in terms of, you know, maybe oxygen concentrations. But here again, anaerobes uh, are not well known to be high level producers of new molecules. So we've, you know, we've really, to be honest, we've gone for the low hanging fruit, those things that we can culture that maybe we have to work hard to culture, but we can get them and we can grow them in larger amounts so that we get milligrams, hundreds of milligrams of material to work with. Um, how likely are we to be able to replace cultivation with genomics and synthetic biology in uh, bioprospecting? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Uh, you know, um, well, synthetic biology would have to make a pretty big gene cluster in order to produce something like this molecule I showed. Um, but, you know, we're heading in that direction, certainly. And, you know, isolating gene clusters and taking those and putting them in E. coli or something that grows much more effectively without seawater and so on. Uh, you know, those kinds of things are being done. So that's, that's good. And also I think, you know, we're learning how to engineer some of these gene clusters, perhaps to take something that makes compound A and put something in that makes B instead of A. So there's a lot of genetic transformations that are in our future. Uh, because of this interface uh, with genomics. Fantastic. Uh, so we have so many questions here. We're not going to be able to answer them all because our time is coming uh, to an end here. But I, I'd like to ask one more question to, uh, to get your words of wisdom on this. In your, in your experience, how can you make non-scientists excited about marine microbes and their relationship to human health? Well, you know, Everyone I've ever had, an intern or someone coming into the lab who has 
learned how to grow these things, seeing the beautiful colors and seeing the kinds of things that we can do with them has been hooked. So it's a matter of getting people to begin to learn how to do this. You know, all of our graduate students go out and do what we do. They don't wanna do anything else. They love it because there's an element of exploration. There's an element of excitement of isolating things that people have never seen before. And what if in fact you found a drug that cured glioblastoma? Wouldn't that be nice? Remarkable. Remarkable. Thank you so much, Bill. I think we'll, we'll, unfortunately, we've run out of time, so we won't carry on with any more questions this evening. But thank you again for an absolutely wonderful talk. Um, very inspiring. You're very welcome, Andrea. Thank you very much for the invitation. Chris, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here on February 11th, International Day of Women and Girls in Science. <laughs> So I think we'll turn things over to, to Chris to wrap, wrap things up for the evening. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, it is a fantastic day to be hosting this talk. And if you are inspired by what you heard tonight, consider joining us at GMGI. We are growing and we have current openings highlighted on our website. I would love to hear from you. And also, as we put the pandemic behind us, we look forward to throwing open our doors of the Research Institute and the Academy and inviting all of you to come for a tour, some wine and cheese and some fellowship. Thank you so much to Bill and Andrea for sharing their time and work and stories with us this evening. It was inspiring. And um, thank you again to our sponsors, the 1911 Trust, the James and Gail Bacon uh, Family Trust, and to everyone out there for joining in and continuing to support GMGI's mission. Please stay tuned and stay in touch. We have a fantastic lineup of amazing science innovators planned for the spring. Uh, a group of three women are gonna follow. So again, celebrating our International Day of Women and Girls in Science. I'm gonna post that lineup for all of you right now. So stay on one more minute so you can save the dates. Good night, everyone. Thank you, and I'll see you next month.